With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. No, Lucky Land Casino. With cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Happy Olympic Day. And what better thing in life is there than an Olympic gold medal hanging around your neck? But what happens when it's not? When it's actually like a chain around your neck? In this episode of Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic Sport Podcast, we focus on the mental health of winning and look at the support that's now out there. I'm Michael. And I'm John, and we're joined by Olympic champion hockey goalkeeper Maddie Hinch and Rio medal winner in track cycling Katie Marchant to discuss the downsides of victory. In contrast, we have Olympic debutantes, and I'm allowed to say synchronised swimmers as well, Isabel Thorpe and Kate Shortman. No, you're not. It's artistic swimming these days. But we'll also round up the latest team announcements in cycling, boxing, swimming and all the other latest news ahead of Tokyo 2020 for Team GB and Paralympics GB. And one of Britain's greatest ever gymnasts joins us to talk about Team GB's campaign to get people active this summer. You can get in touch as well at Anything But F on Twitter or you can message us on that or see us on Insta and Facebook. Uh, Our website is www.anythingbutfooty.com or you can just email us anythingbutfooty at gmail.com if you want to get involved in the Olympic and Paralympic conversation. And it's a very packed podcast for Olympic Day. So we will start with cycling and we all imagine winning an Olympic medal to bring untold joy and euphoria But as we edge closer to the Games of 2020 in 2021, a word of warning from those who were successful in Rio. Cyclist Katie Marchant won a bronze medal. But when I met her at the National Cycling Centre in Manchester at the team announcement day, she told me she really struggled in the aftermath of the Games. I was going to Rio for the experience. Um, This is what I kept telling myself. Um, And I actually was just going for the experience. So to come away with the bronze medal was obviously an absolute whirlwind. Um a surreal experience that I will absolutely never forget, but one that I found quite hard to deal with when I got back. Um, I went from being a new member of the team to an Olympic medalist and one of the most senior members of the team, Um, you know, after Becky retired in 2016, 2017. um, I was like the lone standing female sprinter um, and then had academy riders and the riders below like looking up to me. And that was a weird position to be in um, and one I'd, didn't expect to find myself in so soon as I still felt like a new member of the team and you know new to the relatively new to the sport and um, so yeah that took me a couple of years to actually find my mojo but yeah I finally got it back now and feel like a fully fledged senior member of the team. <laughs> Did you not think you were going to get a medal because I went and had a cup of tea with Ian Dyer on the eve of the track program starting and he said to me he said every member of this track team will win a medal it wasn't can but he said will win a medal did you not have that belief um I tried not to think too much about it I think obviously the nature of sport we always want to win and I didn't want to go to the Olympics just to take part I wanted to go to the Olympics to win um but I was only three years into the sport and still learning about track cycling so for me I was always thinking focus on Tokyo use this as a great opportunity to find your feet and see where you're at um and yeah I remember just even after qualifying I think I qualified second And I was just like, oh my gosh, like what is happening? And then every day I raced and it was for three days and I got through another round and I kept saying to myself, don't put pressure on yourself, just have a nice time and see where you get and just kept getting further and further. And I think, yeah, it's only now every now and again do I sit down and pinch myself and say like, gosh, you actually won a bronze medal at your first Olympics. Like that's pretty cool. 
And your headspace now, where's that? Um, I feel really good, you know. Um, I really, really, really enjoyed the last 12 months of my life. Um, there's not been any pressures of qualifying for the Olympics and, you know, all that was done. We were able to just focus solely on training, recovering, eating, sleeping, you know, without all the travelling and stuff. Uh, there's downsides to not going to races because you have no idea really where you're at or where the rest of the world is at, but we've managed to flip it on its head a little bit and make the most of the opportunities we've been given to have an extra 12 months to get fitter, faster and stronger and be the best that we've ever been. And in wider terms, in general terms, everyone's riding a bike because there was nothing else to do in 2020. So people got off their backsides and they went walking and they went cycling. That must be great for you guys. Absolutely, yeah. I felt very fortunate that I already had a road bike because trying to get hold of a road bike at that time was absolutely impossible. But it literally was so nice. So in lockdown, obviously, the track was closed. We had to do a lot on the road. And as a sprinter, that's not something that we do a lot of. But I absolutely found a love for it. Um, and I think it was the fact that there were so many people out doing it as well and every corner you turned it was higher morning afternoon you know and it was absolutely great and I really felt like a part of like a large community of people um and that was great that was great uh, the roads where I live are absolutely amazing so yeah they're quite popular and yeah I found an absolute love for it brilliant interview from Michael fortunately Katie has come through the issues she's experienced and is now heading to Tokyo confirmed as part of that cycling team her story is not unique though. We all recall the triumph of the history-making hockey team, but for one of the heroes that night, goalkeeper Maddie Hinch, who saved in the penalty shootout for Team GB, again achieving her ambition of an Olympic gold, brought with it mental health struggles and the need to step off the programme for a spell. So I stepped away because I I probably battled with um, my own demons in my head off the back of Rio and, and trying to repeat that I guess I you know it it came with its challenges that medal I, I would never change it but like think having the taste of like the ultimate experience and the role that I played is it's something that I yeah was incredible and hard to explain but but it's something that I then seeked every time I stepped on the pitch and I wanted to be perfect and I wanted to be the superhero and I wanted to make everyone proud and all of a sudden my following was so much bigger and so many people with opinions and it was tiring. It was really tiring and I got it wrong. Um, so then I just was like, right, uh, you know, at the minute I'm dreading putting my pads on and I'm dreading the idea of playing, which was a big, big red flag. Um, so I needed to do something about it. So I just was like, I need to step away. I need to kind of reassess and work out one. Number one, do I still love playing? Like if I don't, then this decision is easy. I call it a day. But thankfully, the break kind of gave me that kind of uh, ability to restart and um and come back refreshed and and feel ready to kind of give my kind of all back to the squad because uh, for a long time I'd kind of not really been yeah the, the person that they needed me to be was there a certain person a certain group uh England hockey who helped with that decision to get to that point where you go actually I do want to come back I mean, like, first and foremost, the fact that the programme were incredibly supportive in me stepping around. I don't think it had been really done before on that scale, or at least for that sort of length of time. Um, you know, they straight away were like, look, what do you need from us? And, and we're, we're here, even though you're not around anymore, we are very much here. And I was able to access still kind of the help that I wanted. Um, I, I, on purpose, tried to detach myself as much from it because I thought I needed to do that to kind of really reflect and, and work out what was going on um and then when I came back you know it's still been an ongoing thing that the reality of that break was that it fixed kind of the short-term um tiredness I guess uh, but like longer term I've still always had this kind of challenge in my own head to uh deal with the pressures and expectations that have come off the back of Rio there's no hiding from them I probably build them up more in my head than I should um, but like the reality of dealing with all this is, has been a, a, a battle for the entire cycle um, and, you know, having access to an incredible psychologist, therapist, whoever I need um, and people being so open to, to allowing me to do all that has been the difference really of why I'm still here and why I'm, you know, on that team sheet. We've spoken to about 80 different athletes who are on their way to Tokyo over the course of a radio series that we're putting together, Maddie, at the moment. Uh, and Catherine Granger said to us as part of our Legends Week that after London 2012, it was the ideal moment to step away. But actually, she then felt like she needed to go and try and prove herself. Or there was another challenge that she wanted to see. Could I come back for Rio? And she did. 
She came back for a silver medal. Is that is there something that's driving you to Tokyo? <sighs> it's a hard one because I think she had a very specific idea of what she is that she wanted to come back for. And she knew that that was it. I think for me, I, I spent I spent like four years not really knowing what it was I was chasing. Like I was chasing like perfection to my game that didn't exist. A, ch- a feeling that was almost impossible to repeat, uh, you know, and, and, and so I had to t- step away. And one of the biggest things someone's ever asked me and, and as always hit home, it's like, why are you here? Like really like, why are you still here? And it always comes back to, because I just literally love stopping hockey balls. Like I just do, like every time I do, it's an unbelievable feeling. So that makes it easy to kind of be like, that's why I'm here. And that's really all that should matter right now. So that's what kind of my mind has to be going into Tokyo. It's why I want to go. I want to go because I want to be able to stop hockey balls on the biggest stage on the earth and the sporting um, stage. And, and and do it for my teammates and um, and be excited about, you know, having those feelings over and over again. So that's what I'm focusing on. You know, if I try and go out there and go, right, I've got to, uh, I've got to see if I can do it again. I've got to see if I can be that hero. Like that's, that, that's not going to work for sure. That for me doesn't work. Um, I have to, you have to play with a smile on my face. And in Rio, I'm, I do remember feeling just always excited about making the next save. And I think over the last five years, I've I've lost my way a little bit with that. And and now it's my focus for sure. Interesting stuff there from Maddie Hinch. We'll get to the serious points in a moment, but we must mention her dog who was asleep next to her during that interview. And if you heard some strange noises, it wasn't John, it wasn't me, it wasn't Maddie, it was the snoring dog. (laughs) It was so cute. We'll have to post a picture on Twitter um and uh the insta and whatever so you can see it it was so cute but it was it was a bit like what is that noise what i, I thought it was michael's tummy rumbling at one point but uh but no it was definitely the dog but on a on a more serious note what i loved about those two conversations that we had was that people are talking about it yeah. and that is the thing that has changed when we went to rio i'm not sure we ever thought for a moment about mental health of the athletes particularly they didn't talk to us about it don't think we talked to them about it unless it was something that had come up before but it wasn't something and i do know that team gb and all the um, national organizations have their policies and had their policies then but it feels like the conversation has started in the last five years and it's being maintained and it's okay to say i'm not okay and i think one of the reasons why we were both very keen on anything but footy to bring you those two interviews in particular, Katie Marchant and Maddie Hinch, was we had a bronze medalist and a gold medalist talking about how in the aftermath of such success, actually it still wasn't easy for them. Katie Marchant, as you heard in that conversation, went to Rio for experience. She didn't really think she was going there to win a medal. And she struggled then when she got back to Manchester in the velodrome that she was now a medalist. She was a senior member of the team and suddenly people were looking up to her. And that took her into some dark places. And Maddie Hinch, she went to such a place where she wasn't enjoying playing her hockey, as we heard. She stepped off the programme. But great to hear now. She has a love for it back. As she said there to us towards the end, I just love stopping hockey balls. And, you know, Maddie (laughs) Hinch was in such a huge moment, possibly the biggest collective Team GB moment of the last games. And people will be astounded to hear that it didn't bring all the happiness, the joy and success that perhaps in that immediate aftermath in the Diodoro, we all thought it would. And the great news is that they have been supported through it and they have come through it. They've had the help, they've come through it. And that, as you rightly say, the bronze and gold medalist are now back five years later at another Olympics wanting to perform and wanting to play and do their very best for themselves and for Team GB. It's Anything But Footy, the Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast. And as we've already heard, heard, Katie Marchant in the cycling team in the Olympic Games in Tokyo later on this year. 26 riders in total, 16 debutants with a mixture of well-known and some up-and-coming stars. You've got Jason and Laura Kenny on the track, along with Garrett Thomas on the road. They're probably the headline names, if you like. Jason could be the most successful British man ever in Tokyo. Same for Laura in the women's. I would also add Ed Clancy, a triple Olympic gold medalist into those headliners. Joining Laura, by the way, in the women's endurance squad, fellow Olympic champions Katie Archibald and Eleanor Barker, along with Nia Evans and Josie Knight. 
In the men's sprint squad, we've got Ryan Owens and Jack Carlin, who will join Jason Kenny. Tour de France winner Thomas teams up with the twins, Adam and Simon Yates and Tal Gagan Hart. And the 2012 silver medalist on the road, Lizzie Dagnan, goes again in the women's road race alongside Anna Shackley. Watch out for Tom Pidcock in the men's mountain bike. Apparently, he could ride any bike. He could become a superstar on the road as well in the future. But he's been picked for the team for the mountain bike in this one. Charlotte Worthington and Declan Brooks in the BMX freestyle. It's a brand new event. Jumps, twists, even somersaults on a bike. Uh, Ed Clancy, as you mentioned, Michael, will be aiming for his fourth consecutive team pursuit gold medal. Uh, He is Yorkshire's greatest ever Olympian. Tell that to Jess Ennis Hill. And he will be joined in the men's endurance squad by Ethan Hayter, Ethan Vernon, Matt Walls and Ollie Wood. Now, in artistic swimming, or synchronised swimming, as John insists yes. insists yes. on calling it. It's not me, as you'll hear. It's not me. No, it's not just you. But we do have a team going, um, following in the footsteps of the team that went to Rio, of course, and London before that. The team of 2021 are Isabel Thorpe and Kate Shortman. They've been confirmed by Team GB, as predicted on the last episode of Anything But Footy. It is an Olympic debut for both. So let's meet the team who will be hoping to win the country's first ever artistic swimming medal and find out more about the sport. I'm Isabel Thorpe, artistic swimmer, and I'm just, yeah, over the moon to be going to the Olympics. I'm so excited. Obviously, with all the postponements and everything, it's been a real long time coming, but I'm just, yeah, super excited. It means so much to me because I know I put in so much hard work, uh, like all the athletes, I'm sure, but I'm just, yeah, it means so much, and I'm really excited. And for the uninitiated that don't know, we used to call it synchronised swimming. We now yep. call it artistic swimming. Yep. So tell us what your programme is, what you're actually going to be competing in when you get to Japan. So I'm competing in the duet event. So it's just me and Kate um, doing the duet. So it's just two people in the pool. And we will swim a technical routine and a free routine. So two different routines. Uh, the technical routine, you have to perform certain elements within that routine. Whereas the free routine is like, Kind of like a freestyle, so it's, it's um, similar to ice skating. Do you mind it being called synchro? Because Michael tells me off every episode of the podcast <laughs> when I go, let's talk synchronised <laughs> swimming. <laughs> I mean, I don't mind particularly, but I think that a lot of people have bad connotations with synchronised swimming and they, they kind of, you know, it's all about the makeup and the, you know, dancing around the pool and all of that stuff. And artistic swimming, I think it's meant to be a more serious name and so hopefully people can then take it a bit more seriously. <laughs> So tell us about how you qualified because you went to Barcelona and had to finish in the top nine. Yeah. So it's a very, very complicated process to synchro. Uh, I'll probably end up still calling it synchro. So yeah, sorry. So even though you're just getting told off, I will probably still call it synchro. I'm so used to it still. Um, So it's very, yeah, it's very complicated. There's 22 duets that go through, um, but then there's continental places. So each continent has uh, one country that goes through for the team event and then they get duet places so it, it, it is all very confusing but at the end of the day we ended up having to get top nine um it was the last qualification event so other teams had qualified already other countries had qualified already and this was the last last part of the qualification it was just the last top nine um and we managed to make it so really, really pleased with that i'm interested in terms of what happens between now and tokyo is it if you like a routine that you work on or do you bring something new out for the Olympic Games or is it just an improvement on what you've already been doing? Yeah, it's just it's mainly an improvement, hopefully, on what we've already been doing. And it, with uh, with artistic swimming, the routines take so long to perfect because obviously they're three minutes long and we have to do everything exactly the same in time. No, no differences. So it takes a lot of hours to get that the same. Uh, I mean, you can try it on land, which is easier, but then as soon as you get in the pool, it's a different story. It makes it so much harder. So obviously it takes a long time to perfect one routine. So it would be a bit silly of us to change routines so close to the Olympics. So we just work on one routine. So we've had our free duet for two years now and our technical routine is new this year, but we've been training it for the whole year. Um, so yeah, we'll just keep perfecting those um, and improving those up until the Olympics. And is it a judged event? How does that work? How are you scored? Yeah, so it's a judged event, um, obviously one out of ten, and you have artistic impression judges, so people who they judge more on how how you swim to the music and how you interpret the music, what your choreography is like, um, and then you have technical ju- um, execution, 
So it's how well, obviously, the routine is executed and the difficulty, so how difficult your routine is. And you have different judges for different things. And they'll sit either side of the pool and watch the routine and give you a score pretty much out of 10. Um, and to be getting kind of 83 and above is like a really good, it's a good score, basically. What do you want to go and achieve in Tokyo? You said it's a dream to get picked. So what is now the dream? I think for us to go there and hopefully make a final, that's a, that would be a good achievement for us. I think that we're still so young, so we have a lot of time in the sport. We can hopefully improve for the next games. Um, and it does take a long time for you to get your name out there and your country out there um, in artistic swimming as it is such a um, subjective sport. So it's really hard to get your name you know, out there. And um, I think for us also to just really enjoy it as it is our first games. And after everything, after the postponement, and just really, really enjoy it and make the most of everything, yeah. I'm Kate Shortman. I'm an artistic swimmer for Team GB. And I am so excited to be part of this Olympic experience. Words cannot express how buzzing we are um, and honored to be part of the team. Um, yeah, it really is the work of 10 years and a lifelong dream of going to the Olympics that has just all come together. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a really emotional day, but it's also such a euphoric feeling to know that we've achieved our life goal. So we do, um, on average, roughly 40 hours a week, maybe slightly over. So that split would probably be 30 hours in the pool and uh, just around 10 on land, um, yeah, which as I said, involves gymnastics and flexibility, yoga, dance and strength work. Um, so yeah, we also train a lot of speed swimming. So we need that cardiovascular fitness um, specific to being in the pool. So we do a lot of speed swimming um, and stuff like that as well. Uh, I would say typically, um, we always get a Sunday off. So Sunday's like our rest day. That's like, um, yeah, that's like our holy day um, that we get off. But um, all the other days, yeah, we would train roughly about eight to 10 hours. When I spoke to Tom Daly and Matty Lee the other week, who are going to the Olympics as well as synchronized divers, yeah. I said to them, does it help if you're friends? And, and, and they, suge <laughs> they suggested it, it gave them a slight advantage. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think definitely for me and Izzy, we just, we know each other inside out. Um, we have known each other since we were about four or five years old and we've spent the majority of our life together. Um, so we are like sisters, but we're also like best friends and we, it, it's just strange because we know exactly what each other's thinking. If we're in a room of people, we can look at each other and just know exactly what the other one's thinking. So, um, I think in that sense, it definitely helps that we've um, got that connection. And um, especially in the pool, we've got so much experience of competing with each other. We know how we deal with nerves, with pressure, uh, with injuries, if things don't go right, if things go really well. Um, so yeah, we know all of that about each other, which I think is a massive advantage. And, and a quick word as well on how you're funded as well, Kate, because I understand it's like Swim England rather than, say, UK Sport or, or the, the money comes from. We stick to doing the training and we kind of try and forget about that. It can be, you know, sometimes it can be a bit demoralising when people don't think your sport is worth the funding or they don't recognise that you spend all this time training. And it is really demoralising sometimes when, when people say, you know, artistic swimming is not a sport. Um, and, and yeah, I just, I think we just leave all of that behind us because we have to, and we just get the work done and, um, yeah, we, we just train really hard regardless of the funding situation and all of that. And I guess at the end of the day, money doesn't make your legs move faster. Money doesn't make you more muscular. It doesn't help you hold your breath longer. Um, yes, it provides a lot of opportunities and a lot of great things that, you know, maybe we miss out on for not having it, but we're just, we're grateful to be in this position. And um, yeah, of, of course, we're honoured to just be here and we'll take anything that we can get really. So, yeah. And how aware are you then that essentially what you and Izzy are is, is back to the original ideals of the Olympics when, you know, it was a broadly amateur thing. We now have these programmes in sports like cycling and rowing where millions and millions and millions of pounds are poured into it. But it wasn't too long ago. Mm -hmm. It was people like you doing it, not for the financial rewards, but doing it for the love and doing yeah. it for 
just getting to the games, the achievement of getting to the games, you're very much back to what the root of everything. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think it, it just, I think you can tell, especially in a sport like synchro, where it's about expressing your emotions. Um, you can really tell the girls that are doing the sport because they love it and they're doing it because they're passionate about it and they enjoy it. Um, you know, there are, there are certain countries which do get paid and they do get funded to train. Um, but it, it, it doesn't always show. Um, and I think, yeah, especially when you're, you know, being expressive and using your body to, you know, create emotions and invoke emotions in the audience as well. Um, I think you've got to enjoy it. You've got to love it. Um, because spending 40 hours a week doing something that you don't enjoy, I, I don't think anyone could do that. I don't think you could go on like that. So, um, yeah, it's got to come from a place of love and everything, everything else that comes with it, all the rewards are, are kind of just secondary. Um, but, yeah, we, we, we do just do it for the sheer love of it, really. Their enthusiasm absolutely shone through and they're so excited about going. And they are doing it the hard way, as we talk to them about. They are not sitting there being given money by the lottery, being being given money necessarily by national sporting organisations, but they are being supported in their endeavours to do that. And I think it just shows, people say these days, Michael, young people don't have passions and they don't work hard for what they want to go and achieve. And all you need to do, and we've talked to more than 90 athletes who are going with Team GB and Para GB to the Olympics and Paralympics this summer. And these guys are working their literal butts off to achieve what they want to achieve. And these two just absolutely shone through for me. Yeah, it will be a difficult ask for them to win that first medal. But I think the achievement of getting there, first and foremost, as you say, is a wonderful one. Let's see them now, see what they can do in Tokyo. Good luck to Isabel Thorpe and Kate Shortman in one of my favourite sports artistic swimming that's synchro artistic swimming <laughs> synchro no argument about what you call boxing you call it boxing uh, confirmation two of team gb picking 11 boxers to tokyo 2020 they are lauren price pat mccormack charlie davidson caroline dubois ben whittaker galal yafai fraser clark chev clark and Luke McCormack. Twelve athletes have been named for the Paralympics GB in the athletics team in what they're describing as the first sweep of announcements. Well, in fact, they called it a first wave. I can't say that anymore. It feels too much like COVID. It's the first sweep of announcements. We don't want to think about that as the uh, Olympics and Paralympics are on their way. Six of them are reigning champions. Holly Arnold and uh, the women's F46 javelin, her fourth games. She's still only 27. Also, Hannah Cockcroft is back in the team, a multiple Paralympic gold medalist. She's going to be in the women's T34, 100 and 800 metres. Yeah, defending champion Ala Davis in the men's F63 shot put. And what's wonderful about this list is all of these guys are household names. Richard Whitehead in the men's T61, 200 metres. And they haven't always been household names in para sport. Sophie Hahn in the women's T38, 100 metres. And Joe Butterfield in the women's F51 club throw. Plus some new names, but you'll recognise some of them. Carrie Adenegan competes in the same events as Hannah Cockcroft, the women's T34, 100 metres and 800 metres. In the men's T64 high jump, we've got Jonathan Broom Edwards. Sabrina Fortune in the women's F20 shot put. I'm looking forward to seeing what Maria Lyle can do in the women's T35, 100 metres and 200 metres. She was a double European champion this summer. Andrew Small in the men's T33, 100 metres. And Thomas Young in the men's T38, 100 metres. Now, let's move on to marathon swimming. Alice Deering is set to make history by becoming the first black swimmer to represent Team GB at the Games in Tokyo. After her brilliant fourth place finish in the 10 kilometer marathon swim last weekend, she needed to get into the top nine of the qualifying event in Portugal and she spectacularly delivered. She now just needs the official invitation from Team GB to compete in her first Olympics. More success in the men's event. Hector Pardo wins winning gold in the men's marathon swim qualifier with Tobias Robinson in third for Great Britain. But only one place available in the men's team for Tokyo, so you expect it will go to Hector. That is tough. That is tough when there's someone in your country that's better than you or just about better than you 
and there's only one place available, a bit like in the canoeist, the canoe slalom. And sailing. Done. And, and sailing, you, you can be in the t- world's top three, but if there's only one place available and you're up against somebody else in your country who's just as good as you, uh, Joe Clark, the Olympic champion, missing out in the canoes because uh, Bradley Forbes' crime beat him uh, for qualification. That's how tough. We're talking about how brilliant these youngsters are. That's how tough sport can be. Yeah, I always think back, as I said, sailing. Um, you had Ben Ainsley, who was, you know, the best in the world in the fin class. The second best in the world in the fin class was Giles Scott, but he had to wait his turn before he got his opportunity. He then subsequently won the gold in Rio, as we know. Ben Ainsley, the greatest sailor in British history, apart from Nelson, of course. <laughs> Nor- Norfolk's finest. Congratulations to Chris Skelly and Elliot Stewart, both picking up more medals in the final Paralympic qualification event before Tokyo in para judo. The world number one Skelly won bronze at the Grand Prix in Warwick on the final day. Stewart also bagging a bronze. Good news, something that we mentioned in the last edition of Anything But Footy, but Tokyo 2020 will have crowds. Tokyo 2020 will have up to 50% of crowds in venues for the Games in a month's time. They'll all have to wear masks. They're being asked not to cheer or shout out, and organisers say the decision will be kept under review. It's something we mentioned in the last edition of Anything But Footy. So there will be spectators there. That's good news. It is. And the Olympic trials for British athletics this weekend won't be shown on terrestrial TV, but on YouTube after the BBC and organisers couldn't agree a deal to cover the crucial three days in Manchester, including the likes of Samo Farah and Dina Asher-Smith in action. Now, we understand the BBC offered to show the event on the red button and online, but weren't willing to pay for the rights to cover it. British Athletics, protecting their brand, of course, as they have to, said that they would broadcast it themselves. It's it's a bit of a rock and a hard place, this one, Michael. What's your initial reaction? My initial reaction to it is that both the BBC and British Athletics want the same thing, and that's to build some stories around our athletes who are going to Tokyo. The BBC will want us to be up in the middle of the night watching the athletics when the Olympic Games comes around. How do you build those stories up in the build-up? Show the trials. British Athletics, though, will look at data and they will look at, for example, Euro 2020. Young people are not sitting and watching those football matches on linear terrestrial television. They are watching the highlights online. They're watching social media clips. That's how they are consuming the football at the moment. They are not sitting down watching BBC One on a Tuesday evening at eight o'clock for a kickoff. That's not happening in the way it did when you and I were watching Italia 90, for example. I'm just giving an indication of how old we are there. (laughs) Mexico 86, Spain 82. (laughs) And so that is where British athletics are, I think. They They are trying to innovate. They are trying to look at ways of getting that audience in. It does seem a missed opportunity, though, for everybody because... I don't see why there can't be a bit of a balance between some terrestrial TV coverage. It would have to be live. I don't see the point really in a kind of highlights package, but maybe, you know, stacking a day with a few of the big events, which would then whet the appetite for the big event, but then also having the the online, the social media feed as well. Like you say, it's a rock and a hard place for them both. I'm a traditionist. I don't want to watch repeats of Homes Under the Hammer. I'd like to see live athletics. But I do understand where British athletics are coming from. If there's no revenue in it for them, if the BBC weren't giving them any money for rights, then why not look to explore new audiences? But I think most of the athletes would probably say terrestrial TV coverage is what we need. Yeah, we've spoken to a couple of athletes and they've said that they want their grandparents to be able to watch it, which obviously the BBC would be the place where people will tune in and see it. It's in Manchester. Where is BBC Sport based? Salford. Salford. Which is literally, you know, across the down the river from, uh, well, in Manchester, with on the riverside. My issue is, like you say, the the BBC couldn't they have? I mean, we don't know the ins and the outs, but couldn't they have offered a small amount of money, even because actually to stage it on YouTube is going to cost British Athletics money. Yep. And if they had allowed the BBC to have it for free, and the BBC would have funded all the cameras and stuff. I'm assuming it wouldn't then have costed British Athletics money. But if it's on YouTube, 
you get money that way. If you get viewers on YouTube, you, you look at Joe Wicks, for example, he, he raised you know hundreds of thousands of pounds with people watching his uh, PE with Joe and they donated that to the, to the NHS. So you do earn through YouTube. So again, I can see why you would want that from a British athletics point of view. But there, there does seem to be a bit of a standoff between these two really key organisations for athletics. Yeah, and the I BBC is the BBC has always been the place that's covered athletics, and unless someone else is is going to stand up and do it, and Channel Four kind of tried to do it and didn't do it very well, and 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 went back to just focusing on the on the Paralympians, but also British athletics need the BBC as well. Yeah, and it seems a strange one as the BBC recently signed a rights deal for the Diamond League, so they are the home of you know, athletics really in terms of terrestrial TV. But we had this conversation maybe two years ago with British Swimming and it was the same thing, wasn't it? There were trials, national championships that the BBC turned down the opportunity to show. British Swimming put it on themselves, they streamed it and we had a statement, I seem to recall, from British Swimming to say, look, we were really happy with the numbers we got and the way that we were able to monetize the event in terms of getting their partners and their sponsors on the feed, which they wouldn't necessarily be able to do with the BBC. And I do think more and more sports and governing bodies will go this way because the BBC are interested in big events. They want Euro 2020, they want Wimbledon, they want the 100 cricket, they want their piece of the Six Nations rugby. The days of grandstand and watching seven different events across a Saturday and a Sunday afternoon are behind us and there's no point people harking back to that. It's gone. It's not going to happen anymore and we're in no, a new era. But I can understand the athletes wanting it to be everywhere so they get as much exposure as, as they possibly can and YouTube is a way for the youngsters but it is a lot. You know, it does mean a lot of other people won't see what they're doing as well, which will be a shame. I think to round up, we're a month away from the Olympics. It's Olympic Day. We're a month away. This is the Olympic trials for the biggest Olympic sport that there is, athletics, which is why I'm I'm staggered that they just couldn't agree to 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 work out a way of getting it shown. But you know. Yep, as you said, a month to go. It's Olympic Day today, so no better time to be joined by a British Olympic legend. Team GB and Toyota have teamed up to back I Am Team GB. It's a festival of sports all about our Olympians in Tokyo, and the aim is to inspire men, women, boys and girls across the UK to get up and get active. There'll be free and fun events held around the country across the weekend of August the 14th and 15th. The Olympic Park in London will host some, the Stadium of Light in Sun will host some and the University of Hull as well which is where Beth Tweddle is now so Ooh. Beth why are you on Humberside? So I'm here at the University of Hull today to launch the I Am Team GB campaign it is basically getting people active throughout the summer you can log on to the website pick different activities across the country and then there's a big weekend of sport on the 14th and 15th of August. And how important is it that the Olympics inspires people to get off their backsides while they're watching it on their sofas. I think, yeah, I mean, watching it and then getting inspired to have a go. And then it's just being able to find those opportunities. And this is what that campaign is doing, providing those opportunities for people to go and have a go in a comfortable environment, in a safe environment. And obviously, given the past 18 months um, in and out of lockdowns, it's a great way to kind of get back out there and try some sports. And it's Olympic Day today. No cards in the shop for Olympic Day, Beth. Otherwise, we would have sent you one. But... <laughs> Where does your Olympic medal stand in terms of obviously you won world golds, European golds, but the London 2012 bronze, if that hadn't happened for you, would you have looked back with a tinge of disappointment on the career? Um, do you know what? I, I waited so long to achieve that medal. So obviously it's got a special place in my heart, but I'm also very aware that without all of those other medals and titles, that that Olympic medal wouldn't have been possible. So um, I think you asked some people, would you trade things? And absolutely, I would never trade stuff because all of those other experiences are what led to that Olympic medal. And from your point of view, view when you look at the success there was five years ago in Rio what Max Whitlock did what Niall Wilson did that was a program that was built on your medal success did you ever feel that pressure at the time 
No, I didn't. I, people quite often ask me what inspired me to continue for so long. And the reason was I loved what I did. Every morning I woke up and I loved doing gymnastics and I was very self-motivated. So um, I, I didn't feel the pressure at the time, but it's it's a nice thing to know that obviously there was, there was gymnasts before me that started to make finals and they obviously kind of created that pathway for myself. And then obviously I've helped the, the future generations with their pathways. A few eyebrows raised about the team selection for British Gymnastics for the Tokyo Games. Um, you've covered it for the BBC quite a lot in the last few years. Were you surprised at their decisions? I mean, obviously, um, there was a selection policy, there was selection competitions, and it, it's been a very, very tough time for all of the gymnasts, given um, that the Games were postponed and for the first three months they were unable able to train so um it's been a tough road for the gymnasts and obviously it was always going to be a tough selection because there's so many gymnasts that are doing amazing results at the minute so um i wish all of those gymnasts um obviously the best of luck at the games and obviously um there's, there's there are more competitions coming in the future and just on Max Whitlock, we obviously saw him at the Europeans come off the pommel, which is very, very unusual. You know what it's like to, to come off apparatus. How difficult is it to get back on and now him to focus again on that gold at the Olympics? Yeah, I think for Max, it shows he's human. Um, he, he is normally very, very consistent. And again, we've got to look back at the year that they've been through. There's been very few competitions. It was great that almost he was able to get out to the Europeans. It didn't work on the day, um, but Max is very experienced. He will be able to pick himself back up and move on. And obviously they've, they're have they away this weekend um, competing. So yeah, there's. I, I'm not worried about that fall in Europeans and I'm sure he's not worried. It's probably in the back of his mind already and forgotten now. And earlier on in the podcast, we were hearing from Maddie Hinch, the gold medal winning hockey goalkeeper, and Katie Marchant, a bronze medalist in cycling. And they were both saying that after their medals, they didn't have that joy and euphoria that perhaps they thought they were going to get. And actually, they went to some quite dark places. Did you have the support after your medal just to keep you on track? Yeah, I think for every athlete, that journey is very, very different. And I'm, I, I did have a very positive experience. I, I had a great support network around me. I had other things that I was already working on outside of gymnastics in preparation for retirement. So obviously I picked up that medal in London. It took me a year to kind of hang up my hand guards as such. Um, but I'd already got my business running in the background, ready to kind of step into. Um, but yeah, every journey is very different different for athletes and it's something that obviously um we're working very hard on now i work for a, a charity switch to play foundation that are committed to helping athletes through that transition period in general terms the mental health agenda is probably in a much better place at the moment would you agree in sport than it's ever been i mean it, it's always got to be high priority for making sure that the, the health and well-being of our athletes are a top priority and I know that um, everyone is doing their bit to make sure that is happening so um, always more can be done in every scenario so I'm sure there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes to make that journey even better. To finish with Beth you are at the University of Hull are they playing badminton or volleyball behind you? Yeah, we've got a bit of badminton, there's basketball outside, there's athletics, there's uh, table tennis. So there's loads of different things going on here. And it, do you know what? It's just great to see all of the students um, getting involved in all of these sports. And what sport do you still play? Um, do you know what? I get out on my bike as much as I can. Um, it's Obviously, I've had a little one now, so she takes up a lot of my time now. Um, but we bought her a little seat to go on the back. So uh, for the past few weeks, we've been taking her out at the weekends and she just absolutely loves it. Well, happy Olympic Day to you, Beth. And thanks very much for speaking to Anything But Footy. Thanks very much. Fantastic there to speak to Beth Tweddle. And I've said this before, and you know it very well, but her bronze medal in London in 2012 was probably my favourite moment of that Olympic Games because of everything that went on with Andy Murray, with Bradley Wiggins, with Super Saturday and everything else. There were two standout moments to me. One was Tom Daly winning a bronze medal because so many people had pinned that medal on him and hung it round his neck and the pressure on him 
in London must have been enormous. But for Beth Tweddle, I think it's three golds at world championship level, loads of gold medals at European championship level. I feel, as I said to her there in that interview, if she hadn't retired with an Olympic medal around her neck, there would have been that little tinge of regret. All the success that British gymnastics has seen subsequently and all the medal success that we saw in Rio is because of a program that's essentially been funded by what Beth Tweddle did. So, yeah, super delighted when she won that bronze in London. Mm, and it's interesting. We, we were talking about the British gymnastic team there and the, the, the controversies slightly around the team selection for the women. But I wonder whether, actually, if we, we spoke to some of them, they would say that, Beth Tweddle's moment at London 2012 is the reason that I'm in gymnastics, why I'm I'm carrying on. It's that kind of generation where it's 10 years on. Um, gymnastics is more of a young person's sport. They probably remember seeing that and she would be an inspiration for them, as you rightly say. When you look back at London 2012, and look, we are going to be doing that in the next year a lot because it is 10 years next year that London 2012 happened and there'll be lots of looking back on it. But I think you're absolutely right in saying that Beth's moment and Tom Daly's moment were pivotal for their sports and and how they've changed and how they've developed since then. Some good, some bad, but they have really moved on in the last uh, eight, nine, ten years. Uh, Anything but footy, the Olympic and Paralympic podcast on Olympic Day. When we next speak, the Olympics will be this month and you can get in touch with us anytime find us on twitter at anything but f we'd love to get your messages there you can send us messages on instagram and facebook nice messages if possible please find us online at anything but you can also send us a message via the website or just drop us an email anything but footy at gmail.com and happy olympic day john happy olympic day to you too i'll have a card next time please Social Podcast Network. Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details.